David, we uh, are interested in your take on libraries and librarians. At the Berkman Center, I know you're very heavily involved with the uh, Digital Public Library of America. Can you give us an idea of how that's progressing and uh, what do you see it accomplishing in the next 10 years? Um, well, DPLA is in the process of building a software platform and a front end. So someplace that users can go and do interesting things with um, what we hope will be a vast array of information and content and various types of content and information and metadata. And then underneath that, which is the thing that uh, my group is particularly concerned with, is a back end platform that is um, for developers. It will support the front end, whatever the what the user sees wants to do, this back end has to support, but will also be open to any developer who has a different idea about what users should see. Uh, it's now under development, you're building the back end, you're hiring consultants and people like that. What, what do you see it actually being a launch date? April 2013 okay. is a launch date for, let's call it a, a beta. Mm -hmm. um, there should be something there that's uh, useful and attractive and appealing both to end users and to developers who want to take advantage of this wealth of information that will be openly available to the web. Well, you've written a recent book in January, I think, wasn't it? Too Big to Know? Yes. Um, and you talk about how the boundaries of information have just gotten drastically uh, expanded. How is this affecting librarians who are just now beginning a career? Uh, will they be prepared for this? as prepared as anybody. The information overload has uh, been with us now um, for a long time. There is genuinely way more information than there ever was before. I mean, the scale of, of the amount of available information is just uh, beyond human comprehension, basically. Um, but also the technique that we use for dealing with it, those techniques are changing. Um, and one, I think, key change is that um, We've always managed the overload by filtering. We're now changing the nature of filters, though. So filters in the real world, what we've had to use so far, um, filter out. They remove the discard pile and only show you what remains. Online, we don't filter out. So if you're building, say, an online library or some type of list of works or whatever, you gather your links, and all that you're really doing is shortening the number of clicks it takes to get to those links. Everything that you didn't pick, still there, still completely available. So not only do we still have access to this vast, vast mass of stuff, but we're actually more aware than we ever have been in the past at the magnitude of what is there and what we're not seeing. And that used to be hidden. That is a, a great magnitude that you've addressed. Uh, do you foresee computer networks reaching a point at which they will no longer be able to adequately analyze the data that they collect? Will collection always outpace analysis? Um, sure. Uh, I, I think that's very likely because there isn't, um, there isn't a moment where you say, ah, the analysis is done. We now know everything about this, this collection. Analysis is a, is a tool and it serves purposes. So people will always have new purposes, um, new ways they want to slice and dice, with new types of relationships they want to make and they will continue to, to do that, the mass will always support more and more analysis, which means it's never going to be fully analyzed. But that's okay. It's too rich to exhaust it. What about specialization? You've always, always read about that. At what point does the subject become so micro that uh, one person can master it? Would that never happen anymore? Well, if you can have some sense of mastery by reducing your scope more and more. And I think we have less of a sense that mastery is now possible. It never really was fully possible, but the idea of mastery as an aim, I think, is becoming less plausible. The good side of this is it's less plausible because we're now able to see the connections more and more. It used to be that when you mastered something, it was easier to draw the boundaries around it. You could write the book, have a beginning cover, closing cover, boom, and you've mastered that topic. Online, there aren't those covers. You can write a piece, but you know that it's always going to be pointing out to the rest of the web. The web's going to be pointing in. The boundaries are going to be as, as loose as the links that constitute those boundaries. You've mastered something gives way, I hope and I think, to a more realistic sense that you've, you may be huge, usually expert at something, but what you're expert at is embedded in a deep and never-ending web. Can you explain how linked data will help us out with that to figure out the, uh, the connections in the big data segment? 
Uh, well, so the great thing about linked data is that it enables computers to go through these enormous collections of information and to start seeing connections that otherwise would have been missed. And they can do that because when you make a, 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 a piece of linked data, the right way to do it, the official way of, of doing it, is to use links that point to what you're talking about. So if it's uh, a fact about a platypus, let's say, you don't write platypus. What you do is put in a link to some public page on the web about a platypus. And that way, you don't have one collection talking about a platypus, another one talking about a water mole, which is another word for platypus, another one using the scientific name, somebody using the, the Dutch name. Computers can't figure out that all those things are the same, but they can figure out that all those collections are talking about the same animal if they're using linked data and they're pointing to the same page on the web. So linked data is a way in which we may be able to make connections among these huge piles of data that we otherwise would miss. Uh, you've also written that all classification is biased and illusory. Uh, how can we make sense of the world in a practical way if that's true? Well, um, I'm not sure I want to stick with the word illusory. All, all classification is, is a tool. So the way that you classify something, you do that in, in order to achieve some end, whether you classify uh, a platypus as as a mammal or as good eating depends upon what you're trying to do. Those are all ways of classifying it. None of them are illusory, but they all depend upon what your project is. Well, our brains need to evolve in order to be able to handle new concepts of information and reality. Um, well, so the cheap and easy answer is our brains are always evolving. I mean, that's what brains do. The harder question is, are there um, important changes in how we are going to think? Um, and I don't know. I think there are reasons to suspect that might be the case. Rather than thinking that we know something by trying to nail it down and settle it, we are, I think, coming to believe that to know what something is a, is a much messier prospect. It's having lots of, let's say, links and connections um, in lots of different directions um, to a particular thing. And that sort of knowing by messy links as opposed to knowing by putting uh, borders around You seem pretty optimistic about all this. Uh, however, aren't there powerful forces capable of disrupting and subverting knowledge, and Bavarian Illuminati of the 21st century, perhaps? <laughs> yes, there are lots and lots of dangers and difficulties. Um, there's the fact that we tend to um, hang out with people with whom we already agree and get further confirmed in our beliefs. That's the echo chamber um, argument, which is a very important and difficult argument. From my point of view, even more difficult is that it seems to be the way that we understand things. That conversations, for example, require a huge amount of sameness among two people. Same language, interested in the same thing, the same conversational etiquette and, and norms. And, and once you're there, then you, can, then you have this little disagreement on top of this huge base of agreement. So in a sense, a conversation exists only within a certain type of echo chamber. So echo chambers are a real issue, um, and I don't mean to downplay them, but I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And the baby is that we also have to keep in mind that we can't get rid of echo chambers entirely because it's how we talk, it's how, the, it's, it's how we create culture, is through something like echo chambers. The fact that people, that it, it is now impossible to come to agreement, even on sort of basic factual issues that should have been resolved. Did a plane crash into the Pentagon? That has been settled, but not for some portion of the world that had fully believes and thinks they have evidence. Now seeing, for, I think for sure, that facts are not going to do what we want them to do, which is to bring us to agreement. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean we give up on facts, it just means we, we recognize we are stuck in a world that is going to profoundly disagree about many issues. When you write about inconceivably large data sets, uh, I think at least of Carl Jung's collective unconscious or the uh, Kashuk records of the occultists, is this what we're coming to, a virtual omniscience that we can jack into through linked data? No. No, I don't, I don't think so. I think we're getting, uh, we see this throughout our, our history, we've seen this happen over and over again. That, um, information or knowledge or ideas that were hard won become part of the landscape. I mean, almanacs are part of this. Almanacs in the middle of the 19th century took information that was really hard for people to gather and put it in a cheap volume that they could keep on their desk, and now they just look it up. We have the same thing now with Google. We have the 
very much so with Wikipedia that's taken it up a step, and four million encyclopedia articles. And it's actually, Wikipedia is pretty good at this point. This is not to say that now we don't, now we're done. We're getting to the point where we're omniscient and it's instead of saying, oh, it's gotten, we've externalized um, some functions of consciousness, some memory, for example. And this generally is a good thing. It's a tool that we can use to engage with um, yet more difficult, deep, and complex topics. We librarians live in exciting times. It's something to look forward to, I guess. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, our conversation, and then good luck in your talk today. Well, thank you very much.